and good evening. I'm Melissa Idris. And I'm Sharad Kutin. Welcome to Consider This, the show where we want you to consider and then reconsider the news of the day. Let's begin with some good news today. History being made today in our judiciary system. The top two posts in the judiciary are now held by female judges. So we had the first female Chief Justice, Tan Sri Tengku Maimun, back in May. She was appointed. And uh, now we have the elevation of the Federal Court Judge, Justice Datuk Rohana Yusof, as the new Court of Appeal President. She's the first woman to hold this position since the inception of the Court of Appeal back in 1994. I can see you beaming, <laughs> Melissa. I'm so I, I, happy. And I think there are a lot of cause men out there also who are very happy that the gender uh, agenda is uh, getting nice. uh, some uh, real play during uh, Malaysia Baru, that we're actually seeing some progress being made. Of course, I know it's not perfect, but it's a really important, I guess, Melissa, mm. and, and I'm looking at some of the, the kind of chatter on social media. It's important to make these important steps, right? The first are important, not to diminish the the fact that they got their merit, they're not there as tokens, at least that, that must be the story. Yeah, well, I think, you know, uh, they're definitely there by merit. And I think it's really important that we highlight these, um, these important moves, especially when there is an imbalance to correct. So every step in correcting the imbalance, you kind of need to shout it out from the rooftops to normalize it. And once that imbalance has been corrected, then, then you know, you can kind of just... Um, I guess, focus on the work that needs to be done, the merits of each candidate, as opposed to one person's gender or race or you know, the need to kind of impose or, or make sure that we're looking at diversity in every angle. Right, okay. So I understand, Melissa, the, the, the need for diversity in a lot of fields, but I'm not entirely sure when it comes to the judiciary mm. what it means, right? Partly because uh, I guess when I think of the judiciary and I think of judges, I think about the, the, their history of judgments, right? What exactly exactly have uh, their judgments stood for in terms of their value systems, in terms of the way they think about Malaysia and the ideas of justice. I think that, for me, is always the, the thing in play, right. rather than their identity. So I don't think of our judges sure. primarily in terms of their, uh, their gender identity, their race, uh, their location, whether they come from Sabasra or Malaya, or Malaya though it must have an effect. I'm not quite entirely agree. sure how it works out. How do you see well, it? Well, I, I think precisely that. I think someone's di diversity in background when it comes to the ju judiciary will have an impact in the way they um, interpret the law. Because I recently, I think, spoke to a former uh, federal court judge, Tan Sri Zainun Ali, and she was, um, you know, looking at her kind of judgments. She was hailed to be uh, someone who was had practice judicial activism in the way she interpreted the law and the constitution as well. So I think someone's uh, background, gender, race, diversity, what they bring to the judgments all come into play in making those very important decisions. Yeah, you know, just a small point before we kind of round up this discussion mm. is the question of uh, minority or dissenting views coming out of the judiciary. It's been, uh, and I've interviewed somebody on this precise question, that they, in fact, isn't that much in Malaysia, that often that you see a consensus among the, the judges uh, or they write a, mm. a judgments together, you know, and, it, and the lack of minority or dissenting views suggests something about about the, the lack of perhaps evolution of our law, that we, we're not seeing a competition or a discussion about values, precisely going back to the point about interpretation. So where does that interpretation or differing interpretations come from? Do they come from the specific identities of the judges, or does it come from the school that they were educated for at, Perhaps, you know, yeah. and their views of both the constitution and our legal system. Okay. Right? And I just want to mention very quickly that there were also three women judges from the Court of Appeal who will now be elevated to the federal court. This means that for the first time, the Apex Court will have a total of six women judges. A happy day indeed. Okay, before we forget, cabinet where the gender parity issue still yes, has not been that's resolved. Right. In fact, I believe it was part of the manifesto promise, wasn't it, to have 30% of women in cabinet. Now, we are still short of... Uh, so 30% means 8 out of 28 ministers, and we're still short of three women. Uh, we have five female uh, ministers in cabinet. So it's up to Pakatan Harapan to ensure that they 
add more uh, women into decision-making positions in cabinet. And never too late. Never too late. All right, let's move on to the very last order of business for this session of Dewan Rakyat, which was to refer BN's Parsi Salah MP, Tajuddin Abdurrahman, to the Rights and Privileges Committee. So this was over his remarks on Tuesday, which alleged, uh, allegedly assaulted the Hindu community. What happened was, during question time, Tajuddin was addressing uh, Jalutong MP, RSN Raya, and Tajuddin had asked if the, holy, um, the Hindu holy ash on Raya's forehead was of Jinping's. Now, this saw tempers fly in Parliament. Yeah, you know, I watched the exchange, Melissa, mm. and I must say that uh, I think the Pasir Salah uh, MP's demeanour suggested he thought he was being very funny and witty. Uh, you know, I, I watching it, and I don't know what his intent in his mind was, but I doubt he intended to insult the Hindu community as a whole. It, it seemed to be an insult directed at a fellow parliamentarian, which in but itself... Still, but still... Bad yeah. enough. So, yes. I mean, collateral damage, he's now being accused of insulting an entire community, a whole religious community, uh, when in fact maybe his intentions were just to insult a fellow parliamentarian. The question is, why do we even need this? And what is it that uh, Pasir Salah MP, uh, you know, Tajuddin, uh, thinks he's doing? I mean, why, what, and what to impulse in him, you know, pr uh, produce this insult? Or joke, as he might have thought it was. You know, and, and you know, we were just talking, Sharad, about missing MPs, you know, MP absenteeism, right, in Parliament. What happens when this is the opposite? You're present, but you're speaking nonsense, you know? I mean, is this any better than being absent? Yeah, so, okay, one of the things, <laughs> and I remember this having a couple of years ago when there were attempts to televise uh, parliamentary uh, proceedings and there were attempts to do it online and so on and so forth and the idea would be was then that by having them confront the nation or having potentially the nation as their audience mm. they would be at their best behavior it would impro improve the quality of uh, discussion they would bring evidence and rational <laughs> thinking well wow, that's all a these high things standard. would happen because <laughs> They were going to be doing this not to just, you know, 221 other parliamentarians, but they were doing it to the entire nation. And clearly, that has not come to pass. Yes, what, you know, for me, I'm wondering whether these, the live telecasts of, of parliamentary hearings would then be translated into, you know, upping the ante on the drama, turning the volume up because you're playing to the peanut gallery now, you're playing to a wider audience. Of course, you want to make it a little bit more sensational. Is that, that what do you think happened? Yeah, well, you know, there is that. And, you know, I would shake my shoulders like you did just now. <laughs> a <laughs> you little know, make the point. Yeah, shimmy a little. But yeah, precisely, because television and the media has become entertainment, and politics is, you know, no doubt, has that dimension of entertainment as well. And so Tajuddin, uh, you know, would have been thinking, this was funny, he would have people laughing, and you know, the kind of low humor mm. that you see in popular culture, you know, they're expressed in parliament as well. It's not like deep wit of any sort, certainly not, uh, you know, <laughs> of any kind of intellectual merit, but it's sort of the kind of commonplace insults he did. And you're right. So then the question is what happens next? We've democratized the viewing of parliament. Is this our fate? Well, today was the last day of uh, the Dewan Rakyat sitting for this session and the House has adjourned until March next year. But it was also the last day for MPs to declare their assets to the Dewan Rakyat Speaker. Deadline was at 5pm today and at 5pm, only 160 out of the 222 MPs had done so. Uh, I think 84 opposition MPs, only 80, uh, so 22 out of the 84 opposition MPs had done had uh, declared their assets. So what happens to the rest? Okay, so what we do know is that the Pakatan Harapan MPs and those aligned to them have in fact uh, declared their assets. Now, this is important because that's, again, one of their promises, right? The promises up the ante on transparency and accountability to make sure that, you know, if you come into power, uh, that you do not abuse your position and uh, amass a lot of assets in the period mm. for which uh, you are now in power. Now. The question is, if the opposition also, you know, as we, we, we got from speeches at the Amno General Assembly today, they feel that they're going to come back, they're going to roar back to power, what kind of values are they going to bring to the table? Mm. They seem to declare that they know that Malaysia's changed, that Malaysians want something more, we assume, but 
Well, you know, they don't want to demonstrate it by, you know, showing their assets. Do you think that the public actually cares about asset declarations? I mean, will the public hold the, the you know, uh, MPs who have not declared yet accountable? Well, that's a very good question, Melissa, and I'm not entirely sure that anybody has the answer. Clearly, some Malaysians do care. Uh, some Malaysians perhaps think other things matter more, you know, identity politics, uh, the, the demagoguery of the individual. Uh, but uh, but it's, cha it's going to change, and it will change as, you know, more and more people become aware of what is really important. Do they want their uh, government of the day stealing money from them? All I right. Mean, it's, it's as simple as that. <laughs> Simple because as that. when the politicians steal money, it doesn't go to your pocket, it doesn't go to social services, it doesn't go to your uh, fund for, you know, school children. That's true. After this, we're going Whatever. to be taking a look at prison reform. Is privatization the right way to go? Stay tuned to consider this. Welcome back to Consider This. Melissa and Sharad here with you. Now, recently, the Home Ministry announced that the Prisons Department will be looking into a proposal to set up private prisons in Malaysia. What are the pros and cons of such a move? To discuss this, we have on the line with us Gerald Joseph, one of the commissioners for the National Human Rights Commission of Malaysia, better known as Suhakam. Gerald, thank you so much for joining us this evening. Now, you've done, uh, you've done work for Suhakam focusing on prisons in Malaysia. Uh, what do you make of this idea to look into private prisons? Uh, uh, good evening. Uh, I think the prison condition is, uh, needs some answers. Uh, whether the shortcut answer to privatize prison is the way forward, I'm not convinced. Uh, because uh, the background to a lot of the problems in prison is uh, lack of uh, budget uh, allocation. Uh, and it's, it's expensive uh, ventures to even maintain the present prisons in the country. Uh, there's uh, the 73,000 prisoners presently, and I think it's like uh, almost 35% uh, over the limit of uh, the designated numbers for all the prisons in the country. So so I think even with the present prisons, we are finding it difficult to maintain. And then if you want to privatize, and usually privatization comes with a cost, and that cost is normally not a small cost. Uh, so I, I wonder how we are going to move into that if there are budget constraints. Uh G Gerald, let's just look at some of the, uh, it gets a little more granular on some of the problems you say that uh, uh, emanate from a lack of funding for the prisons. Uh, we've mentioned uh, overcrowding, which seems to be uh, on the lips of people who are advocates of this privatization move, but let's leave the privatization issue for a while. Let's look at disease. What do we know about disease present in our prisons? We've had reports on uh, the number of pr uh, prisoners coming into the system with AIDS-related diseases. We also have heard of tuberculosis re-emerging in our prisons, affecting not just prisoners, but also the staff. Tell us about the disease issue. Okay. Uh, yeah, so with overcrowding and old prisons, uh, health is a big issue. I think the largest uh, health condition that needs attention is cabbage. Cabbage is a, is a mite, a small mite that can be cleaned up by fumigation, washing the clothes or stuff like that. But almost every prison we go is infested with uh, mites and so scabies. Every prisoner will tell us about yeah, they be scratching all parts of the body. And it, it, it's, it, it goes, it's cyclical. Uh, you give a little bit of topical medicine, it disappears and then it comes back. So that's one of the big concerns, uh, scabies, uh, that is uh, quite prevalent in all, all prisons. Of course, the other one, uh, uh, TB, uh, which is small, and uh, or HIV AIDS, which is also small, and the prison have its own system of managing uh, separation of prisoners uh, away from the other, so they sort of uh, house them away from the other block uh, so that they can heal and get better. So TB is happening, but it's not at a large scale. It's contained uh, because there is a medical doctor, all prisons have a doctor uh, at hand. 
they have a clinic within the prison uh, compound. So, yes, health is a big concern. Uh, you need a bit more personnel, you need more money for medicine, uh, because you're managing huge numbers of people. But I think the bottom line is the conditions of the prison. And it's not the, the beautiful pictures we see of uh, foreign prisons, you know, where it's a comfortable bed, two to a room, there's a sink there for you to wash your face, and toilet that is functioning, it's, it's like five, six crammed into a small space designed okay, you know, for two but, or three. Gerald, there's, there is a, a perception out there that uh, prisoners don't deserve uh, comfortable conditions, that in fact, yeah. uh, you know, uh, the fact that they're suffering is part of the punishment. I mean, yeah. isn't there a public perception that needs to kind of shift when it comes to thinking about uh, the conditions of those facilities? So I, I think... Uh, yeah, we're not offering them hotel facilities. That's a given because it is a punishment. It is a legal provision to take away your liberties. But even the prisons were designed lawfully uh, following uh, gazetting a specific number for a cell unit. So it was designed for maybe five people when they calculated the space and all that. But now it's not. So although they're supposed to already suffer just by being incarcerated, I think that itself and living in a cell from morning to night, and that's already suffering which is legally prescribed. Anything more and beyond because of the inability of uh, the government to uh, provide more prisons is actually above the legal uh, requirement that was actually prescribed by law. So, right. so while society feels it is punishment, it is not wrong, but what we, I call over-punishment, which was not designed, uh, and I think that's where we need to, to bring back the humanity, the humane conditions, and what we will call the minimum standard in for any person. Yeah. Uh, Gerald, uh, you know, I want to come back to something you said, something extraordinary you said earlier. Uh, we are 35% over the limit in when it comes to our prison population. Can you, can you talk to us about how we got to this point? How did we get to a point where our prisons are completely overrun? So, uh, that, that's because the... Well, I suppose there's a lot of people who get arrested. Uh, and the largest number, if I, if I don't get my facts mixed up, I mean, this can be verified, about 45 to 50 percent are drug-related offenders. So these are drug abusers. I'm not talking about the traffickers. That's a small number, the ones in the trade. But most of them are drug users, drug abusers. They, too, end up in, in the prison. So that takes a big, uh, a big chunk of the prison space, uh, which is a question... <laughs> Right, you know, Gerald, precisely because one of the arguments made about decriminalizing a drug use was precisely the question of overcrowding, that almost immediately we would see a change in uh, the prison population as a consequence and the, cost, uh, the related costs. Uh, it seems to me that the, the ministries might not be talking to each other. We have the Home Ministry talking about privatization, whereas, uh, and maybe the, using the overcrowding as a justification, but then you also have the uh, law minister speaking about decriminalizing. Is there kind of a conversation, do you think, or not happening or not happening between the ministries? So I think everybody is trying to find a solution because the decriminalizing movement is something even discussed and proposed by Sohakam, by the prison department, even by the drug agency. So we need to find a way where society realizes that these drug abusers are not uh, our regular criminals. They are offenders uh, by law, but there's an abuse, so it's a mental health issue, it's a health issue. So we need another way of understanding and treating them like other countries. So if we move in that direction, a big portion of them will be out of the prison system. The second point is um, the overcrowding is also called by, caused by remand prisoners, those waiting for the court cases for sentencing. So maybe uh, we need to also look into other offenses that can be available. Right. There are also people discussing about uh, the electronic tagging on your feet. Uh, 
so they don't need to be in prison. They so just, they different, can be at home. different options, right? I mean, that there are yeah. quite. Uh, you have to kind of look at all the different uh, options on the table. And I want to come back, uh, Gerald, very quickly to the private the private prisons proposal. Now, you know, the people who want this will say that it could reduce overcrowding. But on the other side, there are serious moral hazards to be contended with. There could be serious pitfalls here. I mean, incentive it incentivizes maintaining and growing a prison population for profit. Do you see that as a significant pitfall? Uh, sorry, I didn't get the last part of what you said. I mean, it, no, for privatizing prisons will incentivize maintaining a prison population for profit. Yeah. So it's, it's easy. you have to make sure there are people you know, in the prisons for, the, for you know, private entities to make a profit. Exactly. So I, I think uh, this is part of the duty and obligation of any government to manage uh, the criminal justice system. So if, the, if you move to privatization, you sort of subcontract that duty to a private vendor, then the question comes, uh, what are the obligations of the state on such matter? Because it's contractual. But you're right, it's about business, it's about profit. Is it because the, the, the concept now in the prison system in Malaysia is called rehabilitative uh, justice? So actually the whole idea is to get people back to society, hopefully as normal as possible, away from criminal uh, criminality. So I think there's a lot of programs within that doesn't want them to come into prison. And you're right, if it's privatization of prison, so why would that be part of their KPI? Because for them it's management of the prisoners in the prison system. And I think the state government will have to think twice because it's an expensive option while it takes off the burden of the state. I think that's not the route to go at this point. Let's work at fixing uh, redistribution of prisoners in the prison by looking at the laws, what kind of criminal offences that can that need not come to prison, the drug offenders, are there abuses, are there other methods that are more effective? Because you and I know these are quite serial uh, offenders, you know, because they are addicted, they you know they are abusing the drugs for themselves. So. So you put them into prison, nothing really much happens. Right, Gerald, in the last minute that we have, could you just uh, help us understand where this proposal is coming from? It's a, it's a policy formulation type of uh, debacle that we have in Malaysia. The minister seems to announce something without perhaps even a study being presented first. So do you know where and who wants to privatize prisons? Who wants to run them? Uh, good question, uh... Uh, Sharad, but uh, I think the Commission has never had any discussion on this matter with the Home Ministry. Neither have we heard of such a proposal until when we all heard it together uh, recently. So that's quite a, a fresh uh, idea. But I see the motivation as trying to solve a problem. But I think without proper discussion, without proper analysis, and looking at other prison systems in other countries, whether it works, it, it, it's effective, I think we should not just jump the gun and try to do a uh, short, quick mm -hmm. answer to something that uh, has, has a longer term uh, problem yeah. at the court. Thank you so much for speaking with us this evening, Gerald, sharing your insights. Now we're going to come back after this break with more on Consider This, so stay tuned. <laughs> Welcome back to Consider This. I'm Melissa Idris with me, Sharad Kutten. Here's what we want you to consider tonight. Now, each generation of parents have had to evolve the way they've had to discipline their teenage children. Now, during my time, it used to be you're grounded, no more going out with your friends, no more TV time. Um, Sharad, what about you? What, did, what happened to you when you were a naughty teenager? How were you punished? Well, you know, I never was a naughty teenager. You can <laughs> sure. believe that. Yeah. I do not I, believe I that. I must say, I mean, I had very good parents that when I was a child did not ever use physical punishment on me. Uh, and they did, in fact, try to reason with me. I mean, that's, uh, I know it's, it's a near impossible task with some <laughs> children, but yeah, that was the main mode. But, uh, and I'm okay, one generation ahead of you where, you know, we didn't have that many 
many entertainment options. Uh, but depriving you of those entertainment options clearly would be one strategy. Well, that's exactly what a dad from Texas came up. Creative way of punishing his 15-year-old daughter for breaking house rules. So the teenager, Madeline Sumter, got into trouble last month when her parents discovered that she has sneaked boys into a sleepover party. So to teach her a lesson, her dad took over her social media accounts for two weeks. Now, what he's done is he's posted selfies and embarrassing photos and videos on her Instagram account with captions like, um, felt cute, might delete later. <laughs> so the okay. one, one way to embarrass your teenager. Well, okay, so there's the two parts to this. One is depriving your kid of the thing that they abuse, right? So they abused your trust by having a sleepover party that, you know, had boys in it. Okay, so don't go for sleepover parties for, <laughs> for five years. And then, uh, you know, you can deprive somebody of their smartphone so that, you know, because it's important to them and taking away something that's important is a way of punishment, mm -hmm. right? But invading your kids' social media? Now, mm, I don't know. I mean, it does, in this instance, it's kind of cute, but I don't know if all parents can pull it off. Yeah, I have to say, okay, so, you know, as a teenager, there's nothing more you want than your kind of peer pressure. That's really important, right? Kind of uh, validation from your peers. So to embarrass your teen that way could really be quite damaging for a teenager's self-esteem and social circle, I might say. I have to say, I've seen on social media parents having really creative ways of punishing their teenage children for not uh, complying with house rules you know for instance changing the Wi-Fi password so they have no connectivity. I've seen that on social media. I thought that was quite creative. Okay, but you know, again, we, and we were talking about prisons earlier and prisons now, right? I mean, you know, I mean, you're, you're quite family, different, quite different. It is quite different, but I mean, punishment, the nature of punishment, uh, rehabilitation, getting peop uh, young people to understand the consequences, yes. the negative consequences of the action, that's the point. Yes. Not to embarrass them, not to scar them for life. Yep, that's right? true. So, well, not having any children myself, <laughs> Myself, I, I can quickly or easily dispense uh, advice. advice. There I can, you go. I can, I will. <laughs> all right, that's all the time we have for you on the show tonight. I'm Melissa Idris with me, Sharad Kutten, signing off for Consider This. Thank you for watching and good night.